Good afternoon and welcome to our webinar on the buzz behind PPC. I'm Chad Hill and I'm joined by Adam Stetzer. Yeah, good afternoon everybody. We're excited to be talking about PPC and want to hear about the buzz. I'm Adam Stetzer. I'm in the Rochester office. I'm joined by Hubshot. We're still very excited to be here. Say hello everybody. <laughs> Ready to go, Chad. Sorry about the late start, folks. Yeah, we did a small dry run on a, in the wrong webinar. Here we go. Today we wanted to talk about three main things. We want to roll out and talk about a new ebook that we're launching today. We're going to roll out uh, also our HubShout Challenge, which is actually an exciting promotion that we've been able to put together with our Google AdWords team to encourage and, and win some great prizes for, for new pay-per-click sales in March. We want to go back through our pay-per-click process. So a lot of you have used our pay-per-click services, but some of you are newer and have not. And we just want to make sure you understand our capabilities and how we approach paid search and see it as a critical part of a good online marketing program. And then we want to wrap up with a few review of the, a few new system updates that we've made since our last webinar. So our, on the website today, you will now be able to download an ebook that we rolled out today. It's a, the 2014 pay-per-click retargeting stats. I'm going to pull that ebook up and we're going to walk through some of the information in it here. So what we were able to do is actually go out and survey about 300 people to ask them about how they, their understanding of retargeting and then whether or not they see it as something that helps them on the web or something that gets in their way. So we first start off by just explaining what retargeting is. So a lot of people still kind of are confused about how it works and how that website ad there's a website ad on another website that was a website that I just visited and maybe even knows and remembers what I put into my shopping cart but didn't buy. So it's a little confusing and sometimes a little creepy, but we wanted to make sure people first understood how that worked. And then we get into just talking about you know, how people actually respond to them. Is this something that, again, creeps them out and they don't click on or is this something that kind of helps them? So the first question we asked people was, you know, have you ever noticed and seen an ad that a for a website that you recently visited? And 66% of the people said, yes. And then, of course, we said, well, have you ever clicked on one of those ads? And 64% of people said, yes. So a lot of people know what, re what retargeting is all about, remarketing is about, and they're actually seeing it as something that helps them get back to where they might want to be. Now, we talked a little bit about you know, where do consumers click most often on ads. And as you can imagine, search engines come up at the top. But it was sort of surprising to see that, there, well, that, that a lot of people obviously are interacting more and more with news feeds on Facebook and Twitter. And then as you kind of move down, you know, in terms of where else people are clicking, they're, they're clicking in e-commerce and shopping sites. As, and then it falls off into some of the news sources that are out there. In general, this is good for us to see because we push retargeting heavily, as a lot of you know, and it's something that we actually, are, for any of our SEO programs, offer uh, a free retargeting campaign in terms of our management side of it. And we talk about, in, in this uh, survey results here, we, talk, we can see here that consumers are receptive to, tar to retargeting ads. So basically we see here that 37.7% you know, say, yes, they're helpful, 40% don't really care, and then you've got the minority who say, you know, I don't find them helpful. Some interesting quotes we got back as well that you can check out. We also wanted to know if people are starting to use more ad blocking. We've heard a lot about privacy and NSA. And we wanted to just understand where the public is in terms of do they know that there are technologies, plugins and whatnot that you can use to block advertising. And so you can see here that the lion's share people don't know about these technologies or that they they don't use a plug-in to block advertisements. And then you can see here that you know, in terms of whether or not people are even aware that you can do it, that there's actually um, still a fairly large number of people who did, had never even heard that these plugins existed. So we're all probably in the minority because we're in the Internet advertising and Internet marketing space, so we know about these technologies. But I, probably a lot of us don't even use them because you know, it's just one more thing you have to install. So this ebook is available for any of you to download again on our website if you go to resources e uh, and then under the ebook section 
this this uh, research is there, and we hope this is something that you know you can use when you're out talking and selling to your clients. Some of the stats that that uh, would help suggest this being a useful thing for for them to add on. I know I've been really pounding the pavement. It's not even our stat recently. Uh, there was a, a another company that rolled out some stats saying that only six percent of small business websites have been mobile optimized. So you know, like that, using those stats is important, and I think it's the kind of thing that is very helpful when you're out and it makes you sound educated and informed about the market when you're talking about some of these new technologies. Okay, so next on the list here is the HubShout Challenge. Now the HubShout Challenge, this is something that uh, Dave, our team leader on the AdWords, on our paid search team and the rest of the paid search team, worked with our Google reps to put this together. And it's pretty cool what we've been able to, what they've been able to come up with. And so really what we've got is starting essentially now through April 15th, the reseller who is able to sell the most paid search will win a Nexus 4 phone, a Nexus 7 tablet, and a Chromebook. And that's all three of those things. So it's a pretty cool opportunity. So for any of you resellers out there who have some uh, pent-up potential paid search leads out there, now is the month you probably want to try to sell those sell those leads. So the way this is going to work and I'm going to is you can go to hubshoutchallenge.com and I'm just going to toggle over to that website really fast and show you uh, what we've got there. So what you need to do is come to hubshoutchallenge.com and you do have to register. Simple setup here. And then there also are the rules and the prizes. So just to dig in a little bit more on the rules, there actually is a point system. So if you just go sell a bunch of really small accounts, you may not win against someone who sells a fewer but larger number of account, large, bigger media spend accounts. So uh, Google helped us map sort of some budget ranges to our, our programs. And basically the way we've worked this out is that there's going to be two points per starter SOW signed off, five points for one of our grow plans, and 10 points for a basic. And you do have to have three new clients to be eligible for the prize. What we'll be doing is we will be updating and creating a leaderboard with an alias that you provide. So when you log in and register here, give us the alias you want us to use. And we will take that alias and we'll go figure out and look in the system at any of the SOWs that you signed off on. And we'll create a leaderboard, which we're going to update each Thursday. And again, this is going to be starting started effectively on March 3rd, but it's going to run through April 15th. And on April 15th, at the end, to close of business, we'll go tally all the final numbers and we'll announce the winner. Okay, so now that everyone is excited about potentially selling a lot of paid search this month, let's talk about HubShout's approach and our capabilities with paid search. So usually the paid search discussion starts with some myths, and there's, there's three things that we hear a lot of people talking about. They say, I can't make money selling pay-per-click, the margins are too thin. And we always talk about how paid search is a great complement to SEO and email marketing and other kinds of the rest of your digital marketing strategy. So while in some cases that may be true that, that paid search, because a large part of the total spend you're, you're selling is going into media with Google, the margins may be a little lower, but if you position it right as part of an overall marketing program, it can be very good at keeping your customers for the long run because you have sort of more legs to the stool of, of your digital marketing strategy. Another thing we hear sometimes is that my client says they had a bad experience with pay-per-click. And again, we've seen this a lot, and that's a lot of, it's because there was a mismanaged account at some point, or maybe they were working with the kinds of vendors that mark up clicks. So what that means is that you, know, you pay $1,000 and that vendor might only really put $500 in the media and keep the other $500 for, for management. And it's not so much that, that, you, that people don't get that you have to pay for the management, it's just that it was maybe misleading to them. So that's one of the reasons we're very transparent about, you know, you've got your management time and you've got your media expense and we keep them separate. And yes, 
sometimes management, you know, it, it is a percentage of, it ends up being, a, uh, especially for smaller budgets, it can be a, a larger percentage of the total spend, but as long as we're keeping it separate, I think that usually sits better with the people that we've worked with. The final one that we hear sometimes is that, you know, either my client or me in some cases say they can manage it on their own. And again, we've seen a lot of cases where when we've dug into those kinds of accounts, there are some very simple errors that end up getting, uh, being made, and people are sort of penny-wise pound foolish because they may be running the display network and bidding the same exact price on the display network as they are on uh, a search network, or they may have search partners on and maybe they shouldn't, and they're not, they're not segmenting out the campaign and looking for opportunities to, to better optimize. Or, again, one that's very, very common is that they're not looking at their search query report to know exactly what people are searching on, and they may be actually paying for clicks that aren't even relevant to their business. So I've seen it in many, many cases where when you actually look at that and you say, hey, look, of this $1,000 you're spending, I can see just without even digging too far, three or $400 in here that's being spent that shouldn't be spent. That's oftentimes right there enough to say, let me take that over and get you more for the money you're currently paying. I'll spend less money in the, on the media, but we'll be able to spend it way more effectively. So a lot of people will say, you know, how can a small business compete? I've got all these really big national brands out there. And the cool thing about pay-per-click is that it, it allows you to compete because you can go about it two different ways. It, you, it allows you to geotarget your keywords, those national keywords, at a local level. So, you know, while... 1-800-PLUMBER or some national lead aggregator is the one who's trying to optimize their website on, on plumber or a dentist, whatever the, whatever the head term might be. With paid search, you're able to go into your specific geographic area and say, I want to bid on that term. And at the same time, you can go after a more longer tail keyword. So you can actually look past what those big national brands might be doing and look for specific localized keywords that you can also bid on. There's also a great opportunity to take advantage of display advertising. It used to be several years ago that smaller companies could not do display advertising because there were often fairly large commitments and um, you had that there were minimum impressions that you were buying. So it didn't really make sense for the small business. But now, with things like the Google Display Network, you have uh, access through a self-service channel to a lot of display inventory. And that means now you can use not only the search network, but you can advertise uh, using display and especially display retargeting. So these are really exciting opportunities that the small business didn't used to have. And then the final one uh, that I just mentioned, but is, is remarketing. And so remarketing, again, is part of the survey we just did, but it's a great way to bring people back to your website who have been there. We've been, for those of you who have been on the phone with, with us this month, we've really, we're working to set up goals for all of our SEO campaigns. One of the things we've been talking a lot about is how to get your search engine optimization campaign to, to basically get a cost per lead that, has it, that makes sense for that business. One of the things we see over and over again is that websites just aren't converting at a high enough rate to really ever be able to pay for their search engine optimization. So I can, be as, I can be great at sending traffic to your website, but if that website doesn't convert, it's going to be really hard to convince that business owner to stick with us. And I, I liken it to, you know, if, if you're a retail shop and you have a 2% conversion rate, that means 98% of the people walk in your front door, turn around and walk out without buying. You're not going to be in business very long if that's the case. And it's sort of what a lot of website owners are doing today. They have these websites that you walk in the front door, people turn around and walk right out, it's just, it's very hard to make a marketing program make sense if you have that kind of conversion rate. So we have to be a lot smarter with things like remarketing, email nurturing, better calls to action to try to get those precious visitors to come back and convert and ultimately turn into customers. So, Chad, what you're saying is, you know, ultimately they may need a better website to drive that conversion rate up, but if they're not ready to bite that off just yet, we have this discussion all the time related to email marketing, it applies here to retargeting as well. You know, you, do you want to have just one swing at that pitch or do you want to have two or three or nine swings at that pitch? Once they've been to your website, you can then go follow them around with a remarketing PPC campaign that's, that's getting more swings at that pitch or you can use an email nurture drift to try to bring them back. And it effectively 
increases the conversion of that website. Ultimately, you may also need to do a redesign of the website. Why not do all of those things so it's performing in tip-top shape? But very compelling business case from these stats that you're showing here, Chad. So I think the first question a lot of people are probably asking themselves is who are, how do I identify a good candidate for paid search? And the way to best do that is to, again, look at whether or not this is a, a product or a category people are searching for. There's kind of two buckets we've seen over the years of, of, of companies. There's companies that are um, essentially there's existing demand and they're just trying to tap into it. So those are your typical professional services, home services type of of brands, and that's where search marketing is great. If if this group one day at one point advertised in the yellow pages, paid search is going to work well for them. The people trying to create a whole new category, so they've invented some new category. We had one time somebody who was um, had created some sort of uh, build it yourself UFO. I mean, there's not a lot of category, a lot of demand out there for for basically people. Um, it, wanting to build their own UFO in that particular case. So paid search isn't as good. You can search build my own F UFO and there's just not going to be a lot of people looking to buy that product. Whereas with someone looking for a home services or professional services, there's going to be a lot more demand. The one exception to that is that there are some cases where the Google Display Network does allow you to expand your reach and, and build a category. But again, it's not the best the best solution. So there, there are... Uh, different ways to go. Now, when you get down to the level of saying, okay, yeah, this is a category of someone who maybe used to, use to advertise in the yellow pages, there are a number of different tools. There's the Google AdWords Keyword Planner uh, that's part of AdWords. It allows you to go in and, and look for keyword buckets that might make sense and get a sense of the cost per click. And we're actually going to look at some new tools we've built into the dashboard that helps you kind of have this discussion in just a second. Um, but you're able to go in and get a sense of whether or not a particular client might be able to um, get success with paid search. So in terms of paid search platforms, the 800-pound gorilla is, of course, Google. They have, in our experience, even though their search market share isn't quite 90%, when it comes down to, to paid search, we usually see it at around 90%, just in terms of of that's how much of the control of the paid search market they have. There's a lot of competition in there. There's a lot of people, and Google has shown to be pretty good at keeping the traffic clean. So they don't have a lot of issues with, you know, networks of people clicking over and over again. Whatever they're doing to contain that seems like it works works fairly well compared to some other things that we've tested over time. They have definitely have the best display and retargeting network. And one of the advantages is there's a lot of retargeting providers out there, there's people like AdRoll and other retargeting only platforms. A good chunk of those guys though, actually a large part of the inventory that they're advertising on is the Google Display Network. So when you go through a third party that then just in turn advertises using the Google Display Network, you're paying a premium there because you're actually paying their whole fee before it even goes to Google Display Network. So a lot of times if that's what you're getting, if that's 80% of it, you have to kind of ask yourself, is that worth the markup? Now, again, some of these guys, because we're about to talk about Facebook, um, Facebook is very good when you have a specific demographic or behavioral interest that you can target based on what people are, are doing in Facebook. So Facebook is, is good. We, it's a harder place to generate leads, although we have seen in the education space and a few other categories, uh, the job category uh, and career category, we have seen some real success, but not as much success when you get into, again, that, that typical professional services and home services category. People just aren't really looking for a lawyer and a plumber in Facebook. And, and, you know, as much as Facebook wants it to be that way, it still isn't quite there yet. But one of the emerging places that Facebook's had a lot of success with advertising is they actually have opened up their inventory to retargeting. So... One of the places that when you're looking at retargeting and think about Google, Google doesn't actually own the inventory in Facebook. So that's where a, a network like an ad role actually does come into play because they're able to broker the deal both with the Google Display Network as well as Facebook. And then the final one here is Yahoo Bing and, uh, you know, whatever the, the name uh, of the day for, for 
you know, for Bing's ads, I think is where they are today. Uh, but it's been Microsoft Ad Center, and it's been a couple other names over the years. But uh, again, I, we've seen they they want they're working really hard. We were at a conference earlier this week. They're very eager to try to take some some share from Google. Uh, they have made some changes over the years. It used to be that they were very much they were much more focused on the big brands. So a couple of years ago, you weren't able to advertise on on the comp uh, names of other companies. Now uh, they're a little bit more lax about that. So who knows? Maybe this is something that emerges and. In some, in many cases, the cost per click is a little lower um, on the Bing side. Yeah, Chad, I think you might have been at a session um, when we were down at the uh, local advertising, the Burrell local advertising conference in New York City this week. But when the Bing folks came over, they they practically attacked Matt and I uh, for half an hour um, and saying, you know, what can we do to get uh, more of your partners uh, to advertise with us? So uh, I mentioned that to Dave this morning in a meeting and. And I'm hopeful that we can work out some very interesting incentive plans like what Google has done uh, with those Bing reps and, and try to leverage our buying power. But this also interesting, Chad, is they said, oh, we have 30% market share, which is uh, interesting. So I'm, not, I'm not sure I believe that number either. But yeah. so they are making a very large investment to grow market share. So I think um, you know, hopefully more to come on that. Okay, so let's... When you get down to PPC budgeting, and uh, you know Dave actually looks at every one of our questionnaires when they come in for new pay-per-click SOW, and we've actually, again, over the years, we've we've uh, learned how to to improve our our process. But it used to be that I think we waited too long to really get into the discussion on on goals and setting of objectives. Today, the first thing that we do is we look at these goals and objectives. But the first thing that we really want to talk about is like how do you determine the budget? And sometimes you're going to get questions like, I always want to come up on this keyword, or what does it cost to own this keyword in my space? And I think that's just because people are used to the old days of Yellow Pages, where you know you, the, the way it was sold was that you were going to be the first ad in the section, and you always were there until that next book came out. But what they don't really understand, and maybe even some of the people on this call don't understand, is that every single time someone searches for a keyword, that's a dynamic auction. The people who are participating in that auction are different. What they're bidding may be different. They, there's lots of day parting options now where you can increase your bid um, either by, by market, by, um, uh, by time of day. And there's even, uh, even Google has something called enhanced CPC, which is supposed to use prior behavior on your website to determine whether or not the person searching might be worth a little more and bid that up dynamically. So ev there's a lot, a lot of dynamic features going on. So it's impossible to own a keyword. But what we can do is we can... Um, we can look at average cost per click, and there are average first top three bid rates and various other things that we can use. A lot of times those aren't super accurate, but it gives us a good idea of what the cost per click is going to be. For example, you know, the most expensive term is like mesophilioma um, lawyer, some or just mesophilioma, that's hundreds of dollars, and then of course you have things that are very, very inexpensive. So you, you have to sort of flip it around. The way we suggest flipping it around is, is like this. So actually, I'm going to skip this particular example, and I'm going to go into the dashboard now because we've, we've actually put together some screens that help run through some of these scenarios. So I'm going to go to our trusty Vet Hubs campaign here. And for those of you who haven't been to the dashboard uh, for the last week or two, uh, actually this just rolled out this lap, this week, um, we've changed around under the advanced tab. We have now have a performance and goals section. And we had a number here, I think a week and a half ago, that said lead value, but we realized that people didn't totally understand that. So we built this little calculator, and it's pretty neat. So in the calls that, uh, that I've been on with a lot of you, we go through and we try to set up and understand what is the target cost per lead. So the first thing we start with is what is the value of a customer? And let's just take vet hubs. Let's say that vet hubs builds websites and does SEO and on average a vet will pay $500 a month and they'll, so they'll build, build a website for $1,500 and they'll do you know, one year of SEO at $500. So that's what, $6,500 is the average lifetime value of a customer. Okay. So we plug that in. And 
next we say, how many leads does it take us to actually close a customer? So what we might say in this case is that people, when they're getting everyone, you know, a lot of a lot of people will say, I close every lead I get, which you know that might be true with referrals, but I always I always I don't want to talk people too far down and saying, well, it's only a one percent close rate. But typically, when you're talking about doing lead generation marketing, leads off your website, you're not going to close 100%. Well, let's just say in this particular category, we close a third. You know, people get three quotes on a website, and they pick a vendor. And we're pretty, we're pretty average on doing that. So what we're able to do there is say that if a lifetime value of a customer is $7,500, and I close a third of them, that means that every lead I get is actually worth $2,475 in revenue. Right, so you're like, I don't get the 2475, but every third one I should get 7500. So if you think about it, the value of the lead is 2475. Now, no one would ever want to pay 2475 to make 2475 because you need to pay people and you need to have a profit and there's other things that happen. But what we've plugged in and said is that a 30% marketing cost is reasonable. So in this particular case, what we would say is that you know, if your lead value was twenty four seventy five, and a thirty percent marketing cost makes sense, then cost per lead is seven forty two. Now you may look at that and say, like, no way, that's way too high. I would never pay seven hundred forty two dollars. But you can kind of walk through this calculator and say, well, why not? You could tell me, well, I don't want to pay a third. I want to pay or thirty percent. I want to pay twenty percent. And you, we can certainly argue through different things. But the the reality is that as we plug these numbers in with a lot of clients you start to pretty quickly get past that people in their mind think a lead should cost $10 or $25. But when they really sit down and think about their business, in many cases, a lead is worth way more than that. So what happens here is if we say our target cost per lead is $742, um, which again, let's just run with for now, uh, what we would want to say then is, okay, when I'm looking at the cost per click and I'm doing my analysis and looking at paid search, I need to know that, um, like, how many leads do I, when I'm starting to look at this, like, we need to figure out, like, what is the conversion rate and does it make sense for the business? So if someone has a budget in mind, they're like, I'm going to pay you $2,000 plus, I know there's going to be roughly a $500 management fee, then for that program to pay for itself, you would essentially want to make sure that you had... If you're paying $2,500 divided by seven, whoops, I opened the wrong account. If you're paying uh, $2,500 divided by 742, then we need to get three leads a month from paid search in order to hit your target goal. So now we're able to have the discussion and start to figure out what are they, what are they looking for. Now we might be able to exceed that, right? As we start doing the research, and this is coming at it from the other end, as we start doing the research, we're going to say that in our in our head to think like for $2,500. I need to probably be thinking three or four leads a month. Let's call it four leads a month to have that make sense. As we're doing our research around keywords, we may realize that veterinary web design and veterinary marketing, maybe those keywords are really you know, $8 a click. So the other way to, to flip this around is to say at $8 a click, and again, let's just use the 5% number for conversion rate. My website needs to convert 5% of the traffic. I know that that's going to probably mean that at $8 a click, it's going to be about $160 per lead. So I can pretty much match up the 160 to the 742 and say, this program should work for this client. Now, if it turns out that that's a $15 click and my website really only converts at 2%, well, it's going to be a lot tighter now. So this is the type of analysis you can do when you're looking at AdWords to try to walk through the scenarios with the client. And all this information is available through just having a discussion with them. Now, uh, since we're on the topic here, I should just kind of mention that what we're doing these days with this analysis is we can also use the same 742 to determine whether or not how many leads does the SEO program need to bring in, not necessarily on day one, because again, SEO is a slower build, but at six months or nine months or even a year down the road, what's our goal and are we making progress towards that goal? So in this particular case, if I were to look over here and say, well, we're spending twenty two fifty a month on on um, on on SEO. I could take that same number and divide that by seven uh, fifty, and 
again, I now know that in order for me to get to pay for that investment, I need three leads off of that. So there's a lot to digest, but this is just as a little sneak preview. We're talking pay-per-click today, but what the team's working on this month is, first of all, having this discussion with you on goals for SEO primarily, and then we're going to start building some screens to measure and track these goals because what we want to be able to do is have everyone on the same page and then also be able to get ahead of any potential issues. So if we see a place where a campaign is underperforming, we need to look at, are the goals right? And if the goals are right, then we need to figure out what can we do to increase the performance of the campaign to get the thing on track. Yeah, Chad, this is all super excellent because if you do this up front, you're, what you're really doing is excellent expectation setting. And we all know retention is born out of an alignment between expectations and delivery and being able to demonstrate the return on investment and the value. And here you've just shown in a very quick little, you know, what did that take you, three minutes to do a quick return on investment analysis, you know, cost of lifetime customer value analysis, and then these ratios to back into here's what we need to do to help you make money with what you're spending. You do that right up front, and now you've got your benchmark, and if you're surpassing that, you've created that expectation that we're doing better than expected, which is how you retain customers. So this is, I think, really excellent, not just for PPC, but really for SEO or ideally an integrated marketing strategy that's got a little bit of all those things, a little bit of email marketing, PPC, and SEO all running together. Great. Okay, so um, so we kind of talked a lot about setting those goals, and I know some of this stuff, again, feels a little uncomfortable. We'd be, we have uh, some other calculators, and of course your account manager, you can talk to them, uh, and if we needed to get this into our training sessions, we can maybe even find a way to start incorporating and, and practicing this discussion. But as Adam said, this is critical for account management. And I think all of us would be far happier if our average customer uh, stayed with us for you know, a year or six months instead of 90 days um, in some cases, or, or you know, never less. But you, know, you want to stick around as long as you can because all of this marketing investment and your time on the street, you know, it's just if you can if you can set the expectations and keep them with you, it's way better. And paid search also is a great way again to when you when you do see the value when people say pay per click's too expensive, I don't like it. But when you do the calculations we were just showing, and you start to realize, gosh, there's really there's maybe more uh, more money to spend per lead than I thought. That you can actually start to say, well, the reason I I always moved away from paid search is because I didn't actually think I had that kind of budget. And again, maybe you say, well, I, I'm still uncomfortable with that number. But even if you're, if we can move you off of a $25 cost per lead to a $100 or $150 cost per lead, we've just opened up a whole new set of opportunities for what you can be doing with marketing and digital marketing. Chad, I think it takes a fair amount of consulting skills to probably do that. I wonder if you have any suggestions, I and mean, you've done this a lot uh, when you were selling direct you know, right. with your own business and, and with direct clients. I mean, how do you get the client there? Because it, it is a little bit of a consultative sales process you have to go through, right? You have to ask them probing questions and really get them to consider repeat business. Any suggestions there for how these guys could do that? Yeah, I mean, I think we kind of laid it out. I mean, Adam, we, we, we spitballed this thing first, and we came back to it, we had, I don't know, 15, 10, 15 discussions, and I came back to you and said, we need to lay this out a little differently because the, the conversation, some of the key data we're not capturing, so we changed around the, the layout a little bit. But I think what we built here helps with that. I always start, because a lot of businesses know what a customer's worth. That's what they, that's what they know. They know, and, and, and if they don't, one, the one thing I do see sometimes people do is they will, they'll tell you, take an HVAC person, well, you know, I, got, I have a bunch of different kinds of customers, and some of them are just need a filter replaced, and some of them need, you know, major repair. And so they always want to go towards, well, it's really $50 filter replacements. And I go, well, is that right, or is that filter replacement just sort of a lost leader to get your, get your sticker on the side of their, the, the, their heater so that they cover up all the other people that ever come to your house and put their sticker all over the place so that the next time there's a problem, they call you. And really, that that fifty dollars was just paying for the gas and the materials to, to sort of go to the next, the bigger repair a year down the road. So you have to get them to sort of think about really the average lifetime value. Now, some people 
uh, we were talking to somebody the other day that was in bus sales. Well, someone selling a bus, maybe if they only buy a bus every 10 years, maybe it's hard for them to get excited about paying today for potentially selling a bus 10 years from now as well. So I'm okay with that. Maybe that one's just a one-time sale. But understand and, and really get a, a good feel for what a customer's really worth to them. Plug that in. And then the next part, again, they're going to probably err on the side of actually giving you a number in your favor, which is when they say, um, well, how many of the leads you get in do you close? Or say, oh, I'm a great salesperson. I close every one of those leads. And I usually at that point say, well, I hear you, and that may be on the referrals, but but what's, is it 50%? In a lot of cases, it is 50%. Sometimes it's a third, and there are businesses where it's less. But just have that discussion with them. Plug this in, and then we're doing the math for you there, right? So we get the lead value, and then we give you the target cost per lead. So the only thing that's really arguable in in this whole equation that we just went through and is on the screen is whether or not someone, we, we know for sure that someone would never want to pay twenty four seventy five to make twenty four seventy five. That doesn't make sense. So we know it has to be, you have to assume that there needs to be uh, cost for delivery and, and profit and whatnot. So 30% is just a swag at what a marketing cost should be. And we're probably saying that a little high because we want them to want them to realize though that that uh, we, we do want uh, them to sort of be able to, to think about marketing as something that, that you know it does take some money. Um, so that's that's where that's the only place you could argue this but that, look at that look at where that gets you and I'll tell you in most cases that I've gone through these scenarios that number has been typically 150 or higher and, and whether it's because the average cost per leads um, the value of a customer is really high and maybe the conversion rate is a little lower or vice versa but it's usually been 150 and, and I'll tell you a lot of people I think in their mind just assume that's too much to ever pay for a lead so having that discussion is going to open up a lot of other opportunities including paid search. And said another way, uh, Chad, I think don't be afraid to challenge them on that, right? I mean, oh, yeah. you know, people think, people think in sales sometimes you just have to, oh, the customer's always right, but no, you know, you're the expert, you're the search marketing expert here, and you need to challenge that because they, if they go in with that expectation, my lead should cost 10 bucks, you know, you just, they're just never, they're never going to get there, and it isn't true. Um, so if you have a numbers-based process like we're talking about here, you'll get a lot further. And I think it was interesting, Chad, again, at this, um, Corral Local Advertising Conference this week, we had this conversation over and over again with big, big players. You know, we're talking about the Chicago Tribune and other big, you know, publishers who have their sales forces out trying to figure this very stuff out that we're doing with the uh, SEO reseller community here. So, you know, this stuff is cool. It's on the cutting edge. I think, I think that if folks embrace this, start using it as a sales consulting tool, uh, they will really get pretty far. Okay, we're going to head on to the next part here. I'm actually going to, uh, these are some of the selling points that, that you guys can use. So every one of the people that work on our campaigns are AdWords certified analysts. We, the workflow that, we're, that we've built has, does two things. It proactively builds optimization tasks that they have to review and complete. So there are things like check ad copy, um, review all keywords, do the search query reports to make sure that you're not, there aren't extra extraneous keywords out there. So all of that is being built proactively. But at the same time, every day when our analysts come in, there there's a score on their campaign to let them know how close they are to hitting the goals for that campaign. So we manage and reward people based on whether or not they're hitting the performance of their campaign. Now, there are cases where they may not be hitting the performance of their campaign, but what that does is that creates a discussion because they want to, our analysts want to do the best and want to hit as many, hit their goals on as many campaigns as possible. So they're going to be talking to the account manager who's going to be talking to you and you're going to be talking to the client about why maybe we're off the goals and what we can do to get things on track. Is it that, you know, the website's not converting as well as it once had or is it that it was never, the goals were never as realistic as we thought they were. But having those discussions, again, as Adam said, being proactive there is really important. Um, we also have uh, I mentioned Dave. Chris is our um, paid search team lead. He's working with each of our analysts. We have a weekly meeting where we go through all of the scores and we talk about it. And then a nice thing at the end here is that all the data is reported in the dashboard. So we're able to pull in the data for, for total spend from AdWords, number of goals completed. That's both analytics conversions as well as phone calls. Give you some 
details about top keywords, and then any notes that your analyst has had over the month about what they're doing to optimize your campaign. Okay, and we have some other you know, items here about just our approach. And again, we talked about the dedicated AdWords certified analyst, talked about this, the goal scoring. Um, we are both, again, proactively uh, reaching, uh, being told to go optimize parts of the campaign as well as reading that score and then going in and adjusting if, if, a, if a score is off. Uh, and we, of course, are, are maximizing click-through rate and conversion rate on ad copy. Uh, we do have a dedicated agency team rep at Google, so that allows us to get uh, in front of upcoming trends, betas that are coming out, uh, different things. Actually, one of the interesting things that's rolling out soon is that Google is going to be shifting away from the yellow background of the paid ads at the top to having that just be white with a smaller um, orange icon next to those listings that says ads. So for those of you who have been forecasting that one day the Google organic page would become more heavily ad-based, you know, that, that's part of that process that's coming out. So this is why right now you know, organic is still very important, but paid search is also very important. So the two are critically linked. Okay, final slide here uh, before we get into some of the other system changes. So a couple things on how we price our plans. A lot of people out there price on a percentage of spend. We've never done that. We've used four, five factors. We do look at the budget because budget often is an indicator of how complex the campaign is. We look at number of platforms, which again is a good proxy for complexity. We're in Bing, AdWords, and Facebook. That's more complicated than just being in AdWords. Um, again, we do look at the, just the general complexity of, of the campaign in terms of how many ad groups are there. So if it's an e-commerce site, I don't care if it has a $500 budget or a $5,000 budget. If they have 10,000 SKUs and they want to try to run ads for 10,000 SKUs, that's more complicated um, than you know, a simple legal or plumbing uh, client who just has a handful of keywords. Reporting is another one. There are some clients who just want to have a weekly meeting or want to have a custom report. That can drive the cost of your of what it takes to manage the campaign. And then the final one um, is, is the client interaction, which also is related to reporting. Okay, and in terms of, of retention on paid search, we've, we kind of hit that. It's, I think, setting up for upfront expectations, but then also making sure we're properly tracking the campaign. So through the software, we can track phone calls, we can track web leads, and, and those are important things to being able to retain a customer over the long run. If they see that they're getting value out of the program, they'll keep it. If, they're not, if they don't see it or they don't know they see it, then the chances are much lower. Okay, Adam, before we jump into questions, I'm just going to pop over and show people two new features that we rolled out. So on the sales screen, uh, we now have a date filter. So some people had been wanting to be able to better control the date ranges of the data in these tables below. So now you have the ability to look at last month's data. These used to be just month to date. So now you can actually see last month's data uh, and see essentially where your web leads came from, where your, where your phone calls came from, and keep track of that. We also added those same filters to the lead screen um, as well as the phone calls. There were a few of our reseller partners who have, have lots and lots of phone calls. And so what we were able to do here is you can now set a date range. So if you want to see your phone calls from last October, and normally those would have no longer been showing, you can now set your date range to last October and get a list of those, um, those web leads. Or, I'm sorry, those phone calls or web leads, depending on where you are. And I think with that, Adam, we kind of wrap up on, the, on our, um, our webinar today. Any questions out there? Yeah, I do have a few for you, Chad, just a couple. Um, the first is going back when you mentioned that the conversion rate of a website can be helped with retargeting. Can you offer us any gui guidance or your experience on how much higher a conversion rate you could achieve if you ran PPC retargeting? Yeah, well, I think that 
it, it's it, there's some, there's some math there. So basically, if um, you essentially, if you're bringing someone who's been to your website, if your conversion rate is is two percent, um, but they come back to your website, the conversion rate is going to be higher because obviously they're they're interested at that point. And a lot of people are on your website. They get called away. They get called into a meeting. The phone rings. Whatever. Something happens, and they they leave the website. So uh, I don't have an exact multiplier, and it's something that you you almost need to kind of test into to get a sense of what your conversion rates are. But they're definitely when when you're bringing that visitor back, their conversion rate will be higher. And so if you kind of think of adding the cost of that back to the the traffic, or somehow attributing some of that conversion value to the original visit, um, that's really how you start to to, to make it sense of why it why you want to, to use retargeting. Even though you've technically already brought that person to your website, if they left and didn't convert, they're probably not coming back. Yeah, I'd be interested in a, a case study on that or some sort of, you know, map to answer this person's question because I do think it's very interesting. And I think, yeah, you, you said it well, Chad, if you're you know, spending, you know, 800 bucks a month retail as an end client to bring a certain amount of traffic, if for another two or $300, you could drastically increase the performance of that first $800 you're paying. That's another way to look at it. It's sort of like a rocket booster. You know, you're you're just you're, the value to cost ratio is not linear. It's just there's such a higher return on that last $300 you might add into that campaign by having retargeting running that's going to go chase these folks back around and bring them back. So I think the value proposition is just super strong. And then here's the last one. And this is really more a comment, Chad, than a question. This person wrote in. I really think every reseller should be running retargeting themselves for a couple of reasons. One, they'll know how it works, and two, then a lot of the people that they're selling to will have seen their ads all over the place, and it's a great discussion when they say, how did you do that? And you say, buy my product, and I'll show you how. So <laughs> yeah. I think that's an excellent point. I appreciate those comments from the chat window, and uh, you know, again, we just we can't, can't oversell this product enough. Just put the turbo boosters on your SEO or on your PPC with both you know, the email nurturing process we talked about a few weeks ago in this uh, webinar forum as well as retargeting. It's a great way to go. Well, that's great. I did have one final thing. I just want to remind everyone that as we announced in the last webinar, we have launched our PR press release plan upgrade, our premium press release plan. So that, if for, for those of you who didn't hear that last time, we were for $49 upcharge on any plan that has a press release, so you can't buy it standalone, but any any of our programs who have a press release with Premium Writer uh, that we're writing a press release for you, for an extra $49, we will actually um, push that out on PR Web's advanced um, press release program, which uh, is, is a fantastic value. So um, contact us if you're interested in that, and we can just add that onto your plan. Uh, as, as soon as you like, and if you get it done soon enough, we'll have your press release for March go out with this new service. So with that, I think that's all we have. We'll be back here in two weeks. Uh, thank you very much for your time. Thanks for joining us. It was great today. We'll see you soon.